of a curve in R3. So we'll start with definitions. We are talked about tangents of curves, so we didn't talk about curves. I should have caught that. <coughs> well, we'll talk about a curve in Rn. Who's in Rn? Sorry is a function of the form r into rn. And usually we'll use the letter r like we did yesterday. So it'll be the function name will be little r going from just one dimensional real numbers to we're generally going to go into three dimensions, but we could go to two dimensions sometimes. I don't think in this class we're going to four dimensions, but you can go to as many dimensions as you want. So generally we'll go into three dimensions. This is going to feel just like the parameterized uh, things that we did in chapter 12. So they'll look just like that. So we're going to take a, we'll take a T. which will be a real number, and we're going to send this t. And the way we use this notation, we use a, let me line this up correctly. So we'll have a t, and then that specific t will go to, if we're in three dimensions, it'll look like x of t comma y of t comma z of t. So it'll be three components. And this is, of course, assuming n is three. It's a really good case to consider because most things you're going to be doing are going to be in three dimensions. So if you can understand three dimensions, you can certainly understand two dimensions, and we'll mostly be doing three. All right, so there's three component functions. Or in general, R has n component functions. And another way you could write r of t, you could write it as x of t i plus y of t j plus z of t k. So if the i j k notation looks like that, so you may occasionally see it written like that. I personally like to see just point or diamond bracket notation. It is a little better for me. Sometimes you might see x, y, z just written one on top of the other one also. So there's different ways it can appear. So we'll look at an example. So this looks very familiar already. So without writing the z comp uh, component, z coordinate, what, so if you had an overhead view where you didn't notice how high up or down your curve was being drawn, if you were looking downwards, what shape would this trace out as t maybe starts from zero and then increases? Start a circle. It'll start at uh, one, zero, and then it will, and so our last component for this example would just be t. So if you ignored your z component, it would just trace a circle. So another way to think about it, if you look straight down, you would just see a circle being drawn. Now we're in three dimensions, so and we'll have the standard y, x, and then z is going up. So in the x, y plane, we got circles. So let's figure out where is r of 0. So we're going to write down the coordinates for r of 0, which will be 1, 0, 0. Very easy to plot. We'll just go 1 down on the x-axis. So this is the t equals 0 point right there. Now, I won't actually hit the y-axis because at any other t value, we won't have a z equals 0 right here. So I'm never going to actually hit the y-axis. 
What t value will put me above the y axis, though? Well, so if we use one, we'll have really ugly uh, cos one and sine one. And so those are going to be, you have to type it into a, get an estimate out of a calculator. Or, of course, now you can use the Taylor series expansion of sine and cosine, and you can get cosine one and sine of one, which is exactly how your calculator does it. And if you go out far enough, let's say six places, you'll probably be just as accurate as your calculator. So that's how your calculator does that. But we'll look r of pi over two is pretty easy to find. We got zero comma one comma our height, our z value is pi over two. So we're going to be above the point that I just marked there on the y-axis. So this has coordinate zero, one, but then we need to go up pi over two. How much is that? Well, we'll pretend it's right there. And we're going to get there by spiraling. This is going to create a spiral. So if you look, or a slinky, or a spring, lots of different, however you want to think of your spiral. So you draw your best spiral. Spiral is probably one of the harder things to draw. So we'll pretend it looks about like that right there. So we'll see what your spiral looks like. So I'm going to try to draw a spiral going up from a 3D perspective. Way easier to draw. Top down, it looks like that. <laughs> Sideways, it sort of looks like some zigzaggy type things. All right, this is a spiral. And of course, it keeps going uh, both directions. I think I curved that back up too much, but I think you understand what it means. My notes look much better. Handwritten. So we took a limit yesterday of a vectored value function or a curve. Let's write the definition of a limit. So who remembers definition of a limit? That's what it means. There's no approaches in the definition. There's an epsilon and a delta. Oh, no. Nobody remembers? All right, let's start. Any? Well, I'll write down uh, the notation. Lim and I think we wrote this yesterday. T approaches T0, R of T equals. And before we called this L, our output of our function, we had called L before. So it starts out any epsilon greater than zero. There exists, and let's use the backwards E for there exists. We're in calc three. So we can start writing these things. There exists delta greater than zero. There's this delta greater than zero such that, and we can use two, or a semicolon, no, regular colon for that. So any epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that t minus t zero is less than delta implies R of t minus L is less than epsilon. This is exactly the same as our definition of a limit for regular functions. To be continu uh, not to be continuous, to be 
uh, for the limit to exist. As t approaches t naught, if your limit equals L, this is exactly what it means for functions, regular functions back in Calc 1. The only difference is I think we call our function f of x. And so little t's were x's, and little r was f. There is, however, one difference here, aside from that I changed letters. The difference is right here. What is r of t minus l? Point or vector? Or I should say, real value or vector? Vector. So what do those vertical bars actually mean? Do they mean absolute value? They mean magnitude, which of course is a number, so I can compare the magnitude to the number zero. Or not the number, I could, but I'm going to compare it to the number epsilon. So we have a vector magnitude needs to be small. So that's what that means right there. Another way to think about it, that means those two points, R of t and L, are very close together. But now we're talking about magnitude because we're in higher dimensions, not just absolute value. So this is actually a magnitude of a vector. So if you think of the point L, which is x0, y0, z0, what you get from plugging in. Well, I shouldn't say. If we're continuous, you could plug in the value. But I keep trying to jump to that part. We're not quite there yet. So this will be r of t. And we'll look at the vector in between. And the magnitude of that vector needs to be small, less than epsilon. So we got one point approaching what we say is the limit value. And so approaching means getting close. And we're going to uh, judge closeness by magnitude of the difference between the two. So it's basically exactly the same. You just have uh, subtraction of two points, giving a vector taking the magnitude. Now it turns out you can look individually at x, y, z components, and if each of them individually is getting close to their corresponding x0, y0, z0, that's the same thing as saying the point itself is getting close to the limit point. So this is a definition. And it's exactly like Calc 1, regular definition. So is, R of t is getting close to that point exactly when, individually, x of t is approaching x0, y of t is approaching y0, and z of t is approaching z0. If any of the, if any of the coordinates are not approaching the, right, the correct value, then it doesn't matter. Even if you have two of them approaching, and one of them not, then that means you're not getting close. So you need all three to match. It's not like playing a slot machine where you can just get some of them to match and that's good enough. You have to get all of them to exactly match. So there are some definitions of a curve and a limit. I should probably underline it's a curve. Uh, you saw parametric curves. This is all just parametric curve. That's all it is, just higher dimension. And we did a whole bunch of calculus stuff yesterday. We took a derivative of a curve, which we call a, what did I call that? Tangent? I don't think I said that word anywhere here. Oh, I haven't said the word derivative yet. That's exactly why. So
So we can tie this back in nicely to what we uh, looked at before. So we left off on continuity. So I can have the analogous R of t is continuous at t equals t0 exactly when x of t, y of t, and z of t are continuous at t equals t0. So you can look at vector continuity by looking at individual continuity of the three components, or however many components you have. So this means you can break down a vector, vector calculus into individual components, one at a time. Now, if just one of your components doesn't match, if the limit doesn't go to the right value, or if your single component's not continuous, that's enough to say the whole thing's not continuous, or the whole limit doesn't exist, or doesn't approach that value. So all three of them either have to have a nice limit for the curve to have a limit, or all three need to be continuous for the curve to have uh, continuity, and vice versa. So one component function not being continuous means your entire curve is not continuous at that point. So what comes after continuity? Differentiability. So we're going to go right to that now. Derivatives. D-E-R-I-V-A-T-I-E-E. -E -E. Derivatives. Or average rate of change. Well, derivatives, instantaneous rate of change. So write it as delta r. So I could write this as r of t1 minus r of t. That would be one way to write it. You look at your end value minus your start value. And you just, in this case, usually we f them. In this case, we're going to r them. So it's just r of n minus start. Uh, and you better divide it by t1 minus t. Oh, actually, if I just want delta r, that's the change. Man, get this straight. That's just change. Oh, it's not the right eraser. Uh-oh. I was doing fancy drawing earlier in calculus class. Stroke eraser. Sounds like a medical device. All right, so this is change, delta r, average rate of change, will be delta r over delta t. So you've got some change in r divided by change in time. So it's the same. And let's go with, so I'm going to let t T1 equal T plus H. 
So we have some t value, some other one called t1. We'll say that's t plus h, where we're going to measure h to be the amount, the distance away from t that we're going to go. So you can either go from t to t1, or you can just think go from t to t plus h. So we're going to think in terms of t plus h instead. So we can write this as r of t plus h minus r of t, our rate of change, r of t plus h minus r of t divided by t plus h minus t, and our t's cancel in the denominator. Oh, it should be an h down there. All right, that's average rate of change. How about our instantaneous rate of change? How do I take my average rate of change and get an instantaneous rate of change? Almost. So we want to see what happens if our time, the change between the first and last t value becomes really small. So the difference between those two goes to 0. The reason we use t plus h is so I can just say, well, let h go to 0. What happens then? So we're going to send lim h to 0, delta r over delta t. And I'll use the last version right here. Lim h approaches 0. <coughs> so this is the definition of derivative that you used way back in calc, calc 1. In fact, I think the only thing that changed is we're using r's instead of f's and t's instead of x's. So there's really no difference other than a little letter change. That's all. Uh, the, well, there, there's no difference in notation. What is different, however, what do we get out of this? Do we get a value? Do we get a vector? So h is a value. What is r of t plus h minus r of t? It's going to be a vector. So vector divided by value, that we're just scaling a vector now. So that's going to be a vector equals scaled vector. So the difference is our derivatives are now going to be vectors. They're not going to be uh, single scalar numbers or just, they're not going to be just values. So we're going to get vectors out now for our derivatives. And of course we're going to call this r prime of t. So what is really hidden in, so we'll write a 1 over h out front. And what is r of t plus h? r of t plus h actually has three components if we're in three dimensions. So it'll be x of t plus h comma y t plus h comma z of t plus h minus r of t, which is x of t comma y of t comma z of t. So if I write it out component-wise, it looks like this, just your x, y, z functions of t or t plus h. And how do we subtract vectors? You got three component vector minus a three component vector. How do you subtract vectors? So you go component-wise, or you go subtract first components, subtract second components, subtract third components. You get a new vector with three components. So I'm just going to combine them. So we get 1 over h. And then this vector is going to be x t plus h minus x of t, comma. Make sure your commas are big when things start to get ugly inside your vector. So you don't think your x component doesn't start spilling over in your y component. 
Scalar multiplication into a vector, you just multiply each component by 1 over h. So each component gets to times 1 over h, times 1 over h, times 1 over h. So I'll distribute that inside. So what do you think I'm going to do next? Basically distribute the limit. So why am I going to do that? Aside from the fact that it makes really good sense, uh, somewhere up here, I said, if we look at what are these limits, the limit exists exactly when each component individually has its own limit. So I'm going to take the limit of the three components and say it's the vector that is a limit of each coordinate at a time. So I'm, it's going to look just like I'm distributing the limit inside. So we're going to get lim, lim, lim. This will be quite a bit longer and uglier. So we got lim, h approaches 0. Comma, lim h approaches 0. Comma, lim h approaches 0. Oh, geez. Don't write xxx everywhere. It should go xyz. <laughs> So just looking at that first limit right there, how can I rewrite that? That's x prime t. So we use sort of all these limit rules and scalar multiple rules and subtraction rules, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to get down to x prime t, y prime t, z prime t. So that's x prime t is our first one. y prime t, z prime t. And where in the world did we start? That was r prime of t. So here is the one you should know. It also should feel very intuitive. The derivative is the derivative of each component, one at a time. And this is the tangent to the curve. So before we might have called it slope, but now we're going to change the word a little bit and call it tangent vector. So if you looked at some curve running all over the place and you looked at one point on it, it wouldn't say it makes sense to say, oh, slope seven. Well, what do you mean seven? Seven, what direction? So that's why we need to say, ah, if you look at some curve, we'll go run up to the spiral real quick. So if I'll go in with blue here and, and do my best to artistically draw the tangents. Now I need to orient the curve a certain way. So let's forget that arrow goes that direction. So I want to orient it going upwards, whatever 
That would probably be clockwise if you were looking from the top down. But let's just say upwards. That's easier. My first tangent vector would look something like that. I'd be going, oh, it would also go up a little bit. But here is where drawing in three dimensions is really not great. <laughs> it goes to the right, but also goes up a little bit. So I'm worried if I draw it going up a little bit accurately, it'll look like it's going inward also. So it goes directly to the right, but it goes a little up. So I'll just angle it a tiny bit. And at this point right here, where I also drew one, that'll look even worse. It's supposed to go straight sort of backwards and also a little up, which I think will be it's gonna look really ugly. <laughs> uh, let's pick a point that will give us some intuition. How about this guy right here? That one will look maybe something like that. So go a little up and then to the left. Or I should say to the left. So another way to think about it, if you were on a roller coaster and you were going on this path and you fell out and there was no gravity, what, where would you go? Ah, that's very good. So in a zero G world, if you threw up, where would that go? It would go the direction you're traveling, the speed you're traveling, but it would keep going that way. Now, if there's gravity, obviously it's going to arc the direction is going to be accelerated that way. So it's not entirely accurate. So you want to think of a zero G, like your physics lab probably has no gravity, depending on what experiment you're doing. So something like that, that room upstairs. Does anybody play Roller Coaster Tycoon? Is that still a? Yeah. Oh, that's really fun, huh? You play a roller coaster and you like delete a section of the track. Now, there's still gravity. You can't set gravity to zero, at least not on that version. You can't launch them into opposing parts, though. Anybody bring a gyroscope? Oh, no. Our star player's not here today. Oh, wow. Oh, did that just hurt you? <laughs> It was only because he had a gyroscope. <laughs> <laughs> All right, tangent vector to curve. OK, so we have some idea what a tangent vector is. It's what would happen if the mov motion kept going without any other forces acting on it. Now, if you're not in physics class, oh, you can, in a car, there you go. You turn a car really quickly. At one instant, you'll feel, uh, the, you'll feel the car pull a different way. I'm sure you've knocked a drink over by not having a cup holder at some point. That's a good example. <laughs> it will stay the direction it was going, even though when your car moves a different way. If you haven't done that yet, you will. And then you'd be like, ah, oh, physics. All right, particle movement. So we'll just say oh, this curve represents a position that a particle is moving through. No, we need the other color. Particle movement. And in this case, R of T represents the position in, we're usually going to be in R3, of the particle at time t. Now when you, have, when you measure time, usually there's some starting time that is usually universally agreed upon. We generally start time at midnight, and we say that's like zero time, depending on, on what you measure in. If you're measuring in years, obviously we're 2,000 something now. So 2,000 something years ago was time zero, and everything before that was negative. Uh, usually, though, we're going to use a stopwatch. So time zero is wherever we sort of started our stopwatch, and then we can measure, take different measurements after that. But 
essentially it's always just n time minus start time. No matter what, how you're measuring, it's always n minus start. So if the RT is the position, what does R prime of T represent? Obviously it's a derivative, but what does it represent as far as the particle is concerned? So to be, so velocity is the best word to use. It'll represent the direction and the magnitude, or the direction and the speed. So R of T equals the velocity of the particle at time T. And we say velocity, that will give us a direction. And not just a direction, but you can see how long the vector is. The magnitude is the speed. So it'll give you direction and speed all in one. So generally, if somebody asks for direction, they probably want the unit vector version of velocity. So if you're going really fast, you'll probably have to shorten the vector to get unit vector. And if you're moving really slow, like maybe you're watching a tortoise, you probably have to lengthen that vector to get it up to one mile an hour or whatever your units happen to be. So you can have some unit vector in that direction. So you have some vector v, which will be r prime of t. And you can always write this as magnitude r prime t, which is speed. So that's the speed part. And unfortunately, there's not a really good way to write the unit vector other than to write it as r prime t divided by magnitude r prime t. So that's about the best way you can write the unit vector. So you can write it as magnitude times the unit vector in the direction. And you can see that will cancel out. Algebraically, it cancels out without thinking very hard. So you got your speed there, and you got your unit <coughs> direction here. Now, this won't work if what is happening? So if, we, if our speed is 0, if your uh, velocity is the 0 vector, it doesn't make sense to talk about direction. So this, this won't work if you're not moving. So this will only be when r prime t magnitude is greater than 0. It won't make sense to talk about stationary. Whenever I write near the edge of the screen, the, it picks it up really badly, like that word speed. It looks like spud. <laughs> Unacceptable. Oh, it's beautiful. All right. Nice spud. Potatoes are good. <laughs> yeah, so if my writing is ever ugly, let me know if you can't read it. And if you can't, there's probably somebody else who can't. Oh, man. So R of t represents the position in three dimensions of the particle at time t. And we got the derivative is the velocity. So what are we going to do next? Second derivative. So that will be the acceleration or the acceleration vector. So our double prime of t is the acceleration. And in our case, of course, it's an acceleration vector. And how do you describe the acceleration? One good way to do it, I can take r prime of t and think of, it's the rate of change of r prime. So how does the velocity change? So that's our acceleration. So it's time for an example. So 
So I'm obviously going to give you a particle position and ask you for velocity and acceleration at a time. So a particle's position is r of t equals Now I think for a long time I've been telling you points are not vectors. They basically are. <laughs> We've just been sort of pretending they're not for a while. They're just three components next to each other, four components, whatever dimension you're in. It doesn't really matter if you put square brackets or diamond brackets or, well, square brackets are probably not the best, but parentheses, diamond brackets, that's becoming less important. <coughs> so. You can kind of choose how you want to write them. If you just want to go parentheses forever, go for it. If you want to keep diamond brackets, go for it. I'll probably get lazy and do something halfway in between the two. So our position for this particular particle will be 2 cos t comma 2 sine t comma 5 cos squared t. Oh, it sounds like the chain rule. So I'm going to know velocity and obviously velocity and magnitude. So velocity v of t will be r prime t. So that's pretty easy to get. How do I get speed? Just a magnitude of that velocity. So you have velocity and take the magnitude. So speed's going to be magnitude of vt. And acceleration is take the derivative of the derivative. So we'll go r double prime t. So. All right, so we're out of time. So go ahead and compute those. And then what we're going to do first tomorrow is we're going to maximize. We want to find when the particle has maximum acceleration. So that's a little bit more tricky. You can do derivatives on your own. And then we'll find maximum acceleration.